silence before him. Keep silence, keep silence before him. Please stand. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy seated. Happy Sabbath, church. Here are your morning announcements. Our incoming pastor, pastoring Ralph, excuse me, pastor, Ralph Henderson will officially join us and preach his first sermon on Sabbath, January the 1st, 2022. He and his wife, Joni, are currently enjoying his sabbatical, but are looking forward to connecting with the Kernersville Church family. As most of you know, Beth Primo went to sleep on uh, Thanksgiving night at 9.45, and Arrangements are pending, and we're asking that you continue to keep Marvin and the family in your prayers. Christmas concert at TCA will be Friday evening, December the 3rd at 6.30 p.m. Steps to Christ Project. Thank you for helping us surpass our financial goal to get Steps to Christ into 10,000 households. Mailings will go out in December but our work isn't over yet. Now we need to pray, earnestly pray to prepare the soil so each and every book will be received for God's glory. Livia Liga is asking all choir members to attend choir practice for the Christmas program immediately following the church services today. Okay. Okay, then I guess I had not read my text. Sorry. And Carolina Conference prayer call. They're every Monday night, Monday evening at 7 p.m. Take a closer look at your bulletin to get all the necessary information. That ends our announcements. Good morning, church. Let's try that again. Good morning, church. Good morning. Thank you, whoever called my name. <laughs> you know, sometimes you have to say to yourself, or be honest with yourself, why am I going to church today? What is it about church that makes me smile? I can honestly say some of you, when you come to church, you don't smile. I need for you to smile because what? This is the day the Lord hath made. Let us what? And be glad in it. So if I'm walking by you sometime later today and you're not smiling, I don't know what I'm going to do yet, but I'm going to do something. <laughs> now look, in Kernersville, there are no visitors here. Your family now, you got to come back. I'm talking to John's family in case you're wondering. I just pointed to them. They knew what I meant. We're here. But there are no visitors. We're all family. And we're all family in God's church. And our Father in heaven expects us to treat each other as if we're family. And I just want you all to know that you're mine, and I love you. So, there is no place 
like this place, anywhere near this place, so this must be? Remember that. Have a blessed day. It's now the time in our service where we get to seek our Lord in prayer. This Sabbath, our church is mourning some dear loved ones. We think of the Primo family in a special way today. We think of the Stevens family as well. Are there any special praises or prayer requests that are silent today? The Lord sees the big and the small, and we praise him for that. We think of Halcyon, we think of others. We praise the Lord though, because he is a God that's bigger than our infirmities, bigger than our difficulties, and he will save us. As is our tradition here, I'll invite those that feel free to come before the altar here as we seek the Lord in prayer, or if you prefer and are more comfortable to kneel at your pews, please do so at this time. Please join us as we sing. Our Father in heaven, we come before you today submitting ourselves to your wisdom and your goodness. Lord, many of us, many of us are mourning today. We pray that you will continue to embrace us, hold us in these difficult times. And Lord, as we turn and look to you, we are comforted to know there is hope in your soon return. Lord, there are those of us that are going through other things. They may seem minor to others, but to us individually that are going through them, they're major. Lord, we pray you'll be with each one as well. And Lord, we'd be remiss if we didn't thank you for always seeing us. When times are difficult, you carry us. When times are great, you're standing beside us joyously celebrating with us. Thank you for being a God who cares. Be with us on the Sabbath. Be with us in our worship. And Lord, be with us in our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, it's now time of that for the it's now that time of the service where we praise and worship our Lord. Our first song is Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. If you wish to open up your hymnal, it's hymnal 334. We ask that you join us and lift your voices as we sing. Oh. 
ready to gather at the river? Amen. I know I am. And who all wants to be down at the river when it's time to gather? Amen. So raise your voices high. You can follow along in the hymnal, hymnal 432, as we sing, Shall We Gather at the River?
now time for our opening hymn. If you would please stand and join us. Come, ye thankful people, is in hymnal 557. morning church and happy sabbath i hope everybody had a great thanksgiving i know i did we have so much to be thankful for um this morning uh, the call to offering is for the carolina youth um, and we know how important it is to invest in our youth they're our future right so how many are familiar with the story in mark 10 of Jesus' conversation with the rich young ruler. I'm going to be reading from that. Um, so we'll start at Mark 10, 17 through 22. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. And honor thy father and thy mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatever thou hast, and give to the poor, that thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, 
and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. What a tragic story. Immortality was right at his fingertips, but his love for worldly gain was too strong. How could this have been prevented? Are there any practices that God leaves us in his words to help prevent covetousness or greed? Christ's dealings with this young man is presented as an object lesson. God has given us the rule of conduct which in every one of his servants must follow. It is obedience to his law. Now, is tithing part of the law? Again, it is obedience to his law, not merely legal obedience, but an obedience which enters into the life and is exemplified in the character. God has set his own standard of character for all who would become subjects of his kingdom, only those who will become co-workers with Christ, only those who will say, Lord, all I have and all I am is yours, will be acknowledged as the sons and daughters of God. We all should consider what it means to desire heaven and yet to turn away because of the conditions laid down. Think what it means to say no to Christ. The ruler said no, I cannot give you all. But do we do the same? The Savior, the Savior offers to share with us the work God has given us to do. Could he complete it without us? Absolutely. Is he going to complete it whether we comply or not? Yes. But he gives us the opportunity to work with him. And that helps us build heavenly character, right? He offers to use the means God has given us to carry forward his work to finish what he's set for us to do. Only in this way can he save us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you've given us so much to be thankful for. Thank you so much for your provisions, your love, your watch care over us. Thank you for the gift of life and good health, just that we're here is a blessing in itself. I just pray that you will work on all of our hearts uh, to ready us for the times that are to come and to prepare us for your soon coming. Pray that you will multiply this offering and may it help to finish your work. In Jesus' name we pray.
it's time for the children's story. You know what to do first. Good morning. Did you have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah. Well, I don't have a Thanksgiving story now, but in my sermon, I'll have a Thanksgiving story. Is, does anyone have any fish in your house? You have an aquarium? Does anyone? Do you have an aquarium with some fish? What kind of fish do you have? Big ones or big? Big ones or small ones? Small ones. Yeah. Well, I want to tell you about my aquarium. I don't have it now, but I did it one time, and I was so excited. I'd always wanted an aquarium. I had a special place for it, a special table for my aquarium, and it was about that deep, about that wide, that long, that is, and about that wide. And the first fish I got was an angelfish. Now, this angelfish was very dark. He was like dark, 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 purple, blue. I mean, purple, black. And uh, have you know what an angelfish looks like? An angelfish has a big fin on the back like this. It has a big fin on its belly like this, and it goes around. <laughs> Very curious, but one thing about it, I thought the angelfish would appreciate having some company. And so I went back to the store and I got little fish like this called neons. Oh, neons have these stripes down their sides and they jet around in the fish tank. And I got probably 10 of them because there seemed to be a lot of room for 10 and I put those, those uh, neons fish in the tank and boy, they were jetting around. And before long, that angel fish didn't look like he was an angel anymore. And he saw, now this is going to be scary, okay? I'm just warning you. He saw a neon and he crept up. He crept up to that neon, like that. 
And what happened, it looked like that neon went backwards right into that angel fish's mouth. And I said, oh, no. And before long, he went to another one. And it was gone, just like that. No, don't, 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 don't cry. <laughs> now, I had some things in my fish tank that the neon seemed to really like, especially I put some plants in it. And also, I'd put some rocks in the fish tank. And those rocks were so that the fish could get underneath, the neons could get underneath the rocks. And before long, all the neons had disappeared under the rocks and in the, the plants. And that big old angelfish couldn't, couldn't touch them at all, as long as they stayed <laughs> under the rock. Now, the Bible says that Jesus is the rock of ages that Jesus is the rock of our salvation. And as long as we stay under the rock, the devil can't touch us. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry to scare the children. <laughs> <laughs> you can go back to your seats. The scripture reading for today is from James 2, 3 through 5. And you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, You sit here in a good place and say to the poor man, You sit there or you sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he had promised to those who love him. Thank you, Mikey. It's not in your bulletin today, but there's been a special request at this time for an anointing service. And I would like to invite Halcyon to come forward. In fact, I'm going to go lower because I'm going to invite a number of people. Elders, get ready in a moment. I'm asking you to come forward, too. Yes. This is your church family, isn't it? Truly family. It is. Tell us what's going on. Okay. Where's Don? <laughs> I need Don. And Stella's cut. So I had a scan, and the results came back, and it's not favorable. And as you know, the cancer has spread to my liver and my spleen, and it's now throughout my body, and it's also touched my colon. And I was, chemo is not the answer anymore, and I was given six months to a year to live. And I wanted to share it with my family, because I love you all very much, and I think you know that. Amen. And so when I say smile, I mean smile. <laughs> and I just want you to know, whatever happens, I'm not giving up. God is my father. And like I told some of my friends, I'm not holding on to the hem of his garment. I'm, I've got a hold of his right foot. And he's dragging me everywhere he goes. <laughs> And I just wanted to share with you that if things take a turn and it is his will, I want you all to know that I love you very much. You're all in my heart. And I love you. Amen. And um, I will be meeting with the deaconesses after because I have a favor for the girls. And I will talk to you later, ladies. I need to meet you in the library. What we're doing is based on the uh, 
three verses, actually, in the book of James, and you may want to open your Bibles. They're not going to be on the screen. <clears throat> James, the fifth chapter, says, Is any among you afflicted or suffering, some versions say? Let him or her pray. Is any merry? Let him or her sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him or her call for the elders of the church and let them pray over her or him anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. We have oil here, and we're going to pray. And it says, the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him or her up, and if they have committed sins, they shall be forgiven her or him. And then it says something else, and this is where we're going to start. We're going to have two prayers, at least today, two types of prayers. Listen carefully, every one of you. This is how you become involved, because you will be praying silently as the elders will be praying here and anoint Halcyon with oil. It says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. I want to invite you to take inventory of your heart in just a moment and ask God to forgive you your sins to make sure the channel between your heart and God's throne is completely open so that his spirit can move freely. This is a condition here for effectiveness in this, that the family itself will pray first and say, Lord, see me. I'm a sinner standing in the need of prayer, and he will forgive. If there's some wrong that you know needs to be made right, then say, Lord, please give me the power to make this right when I leave here. Let us pray. Lord, now take each one of us to the garden of our heart. Show us, Lord, where that evil weed may be growing. Perhaps it's a habit, a habit of a lifetime. Perhaps it's a mistake that needs to be corrected. Perhaps it's a sin of our character, pride. Whatever it is, Lord, we're standing in the need of prayer, each one of us. And I pray, Father, that you will lead us to that weed and that we will give you permission to do what we cannot do of ourselves, that you will take that weed and root it out of our heart. We thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayer. Amen. I'd like to invite the elders uh, here, serving as elders, to come forward. And uh, any ordained ministers here, please come forward. And we're going to gather around Halcyon. You feel up to kneeling? Okay. I'm going to ask uh, our head elders, Brother John, if you'll pray first, and then uh, Brother Don is going to pray, and then I will anoint with the oil. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with humble hearts. We turn our eyes upon you because we know that you have created us and you sustain us, you have redeemed us, and we know that you're acquainted with every detail of each and every one of our lives. And this morning, Father, we pray in a special way for our, our sister Halcyon. Oh, what a blessing she is to this church, Father, what a blessing she is to your work, not just here, but everywhere she goes. We pray, Lord, that this morning you would heal her so yes, that she could amen. go forward in faith and continue to do your work as you guide and direct and use her to, to touch so many lives. Please, yeah. Father, hear our prayer this morning and, and, and do what you are more than capable of doing and help this dear woman, Father, to trust in you with all her heart because we know that you are the, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, and, and you can... You can sustain her, Father, and you can heal her. And we pray you would this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.
Father in heaven, it is with humbled hearts that we come before you, the king of the universe, the creator of all things. Lord, we know that you spoke this world into existence. You spoke when Jesus was here on earth. He spoke and people were healed. People were raised from the dead. All manner of illnesses, Lord, just by your word. So, Lord, this morning, just want to first ask that you would forgive me of my sins. Hmm. Lord, that there would be nothing that would stand between you and your healing, your dear daughter here this morning. Amen. Lord, she has been so courageous such a witness to so many of us and such an encouragement to all of us. Lord, we have gone through her experience with her over these last years and we believe that you are coming soon and you're going to put an end to sin and death Amen. Yes. and sickness but Lord, just now, we ask that you speak the word only and heal Halcyon, that she might continue to serve you here, that she might continue to be a witness to us. Lord, we pray in the all-powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, there's nothing magical about this oil. We realize that, but it's representing your spirit, the Holy Spirit who is with us today. And Father, I now anoint Halcyon, this oil that represents your presence in her life. And Father, we thank you so much for the promise that you will never leave or forsake her, that nothing catches you by surprise. Oh God, I pray that your spirit himself will bear witness with Halcyon's spirit. There is work still to be done, she realizes, and she wants to be a part of it. Oh, Father, I pray that the devil will be rebuked now and that healing will take its place according to your will, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. I'm going to ask the audio-visual guys, I've left my remote somewhere. If you could bring me one, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Continue to pray for Halcyon. Would you do that in the days ahead? How was your Thanksgiving? Were you with family, friends? We had a house full of people, and we got through it without any drama, so <laughs> it was a wonderful 
wonderful Thanksgiving. My sermon is entitled, No Time for Pity Parties. Here these pilgrims were in 1620. They arrived at Plymouth Rock. They named it Plymouth because that was a town over in England and, and there was a rock there. So there was Plymouth Rock. I've been to the rock <clears throat> there at Plymouth. If they had cell phones, they would have texted a message back home at the end of that year, talking about, you know, the next year in 1621. They would have texted it back. And I think Paul encapsulated what they, does anyone here text? Do you, raise your hand if you text. Raise your hand if you're a grandchild. These are the ones that text. If I, if I want my grandchildren, I can call them, and they probably won't answer the phone. If I text them, I get immediate results. And let me tell you something about texting etiquette. Your grandchildren will tell you. Please don't be wordy. I say, Tanner, how's it going? I'll get back maybe F for fine. You know, that's it. And uh, then grandparents text back a whole paragraph. Right, Sherry? <laughs> on and on. Yeah. Here's what they would have texted. The Pilgrim's text message is 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8 and 9. We are troubled on every side. This is the first Thanksgiving. This is what they would have texted. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. That's what they would have sent back. When you think about it, everyone there around that table was grieving the loss of someone. In fact, Governor Bradford probably is the first one that lost someone in the New World of those pilgrims. The ship, the Mayflower, was right there in docked about a mile or so off the shore. They had to tote everything in by rowing. And uh, here it was uh, parked out there, and he and a number of men... Uh, Governor Bradford went into what was to be Plymouth and just to scout the land over. And while he was gone, his wife fell overboard. I mean, she made it to the New World and fell overboard, or some say she couldn't, she couldn't handle the reality, if you understand. That's the first Thanksgiving. Everyone around that table, they were grieving of something. Uh, someone, the loss of someone, facing a cold winter. Their crops really had not done that well. They were not farmers. They were in the textile men, uh, industry back in working in the textile ministry, the ministry industry back in, uh, back in Amsterdam area. And they came over here seeking religious freedom. They had to leave England because of the church state uh, uh, basically was being persecuted by the Church of England. And then they got over to Amsterdam and over to Holland, and after a while, they were beginning to see encroachment and, uh, with the, the papacy. And so they were seeking religious freedom here. Yes, there were many who settled here, but listen, hear me out. Counterculture today will tell you a different story than what I'm sharing with you. These were God-fearing people who were seeking religious, uh, religious freedom. And God bless them. They did something that had never been done in memory. And that was that pact they made, the Mayflower pact they made, where they had religious freedom right there up front in their laws and the rules and regulations. They insisted that they would not have a king and they would not have a, a pope. They would not have a church state. The first Thanksgiving, a year later, here they are looking around, and there really wasn't much to eat. Their crops had done, not done well. As I said, they didn't know. Uh, the Indians tried to help them. Native Americans tried to help them. And in fact, that Thanksgiving, first Thanksgiving, the Indians brought most of the food. Yes, they did have pumpkins. Someone said they probably got a pumpkin and had the first football game there on uh, yeah, the first Thanksgiving. It's become a tradition. Might have started there. But they played games for three days, and they ate, and they had pumpkin stew and deer that the Indians had brought. Going back about 15 years, that about, and someone says, please, are we going to be tested on these dates? No, you won't. 
<clears throat> there was a young Native American about 15 years before the pilgrims arrived, and he was an orphan. Both parents had died. And one day he looks out over the ocean. He was a few miles south of uh, Plymouth Rock, what would become Plymouth Rock. And he looked out over the ocean and he saw something looming over the horizon. Two ships came, one large one, one smaller. And uh, as they came, they gracefully made their way towards the shore. And in fact, they got off the boat and they looked around at these strange looking people in strange looking dress. And he talked to some of them, tried to. They could talk, you know, with your hands. If you've ever been to a foreign country, you know how that goes. But these ships really caught his attention. And then they got back in and gracefully they took off again. And he says, wow, he had nothing holding him there. He was an orphan. And so he followed along the shore as best he could. And finally they, they disappeared, but he kept going. He went north. And uh, there he settled in with, a, with another tribe of Indians. And uh, another ship came eventually. And he went aboard, and they took off and with he and some of his buddies, and he was kidnapped. Do you know who I'm talking about? Yeah, Squanto. Squanto was about 14, 15 years old at the time he was captured and the time that he saw these ships, as you see on the screen behind me. And he, uh, he went to, to England, and there he was trained, he was educated, he learned to speak English fluently, think about this. And when he came back, he was 27 years of age. He, in fact, he made several voyages coming back and every time he thought he was going to be able to stay here perhaps, and things happened. He made two or three trips back and forth across the ocean and um, finally he was able to come back and settle here one year before the Plymouth settlers put foot on this Native American, uh, uh, what we call the United States of America now. Think about that. So one day the pilgrims are just trying to get established in their building and trying to, to uh, make some type of shelter over their heads. And into camp walks this large Native American Mansonai. He was over six feet tall, a perfect specimen of a man. He actually was over a nation of Indians, and he had someone with him. And the person he had with him was guess who? Squanto, who was fluent in English and fluent also in whatever languages. He knew several dialects of Native American Indians. Tell me, God's hand wasn't in that. That's what used to be preached in our schools. I hope it still is. Because everyone needs to know this. That this was a different colony. These guys came over here seeking religious freedom. And more than any other colony that came to America, that Plymouth Company, New Plymouth, group of pilgrims, and whoever came and joined up with him, they made America what it was. Yes, there were mistakes, horrible mistakes, but those that, that have been made along the way. But God still has blessed America, and we need to pray that God will continue to bless America. Don't you think so? From the shores of America went missionaries by the millions across the world. In fact, today, I used to sit on committees before I retired, and uh, the last I heard, every dollar you give for tithe, 40% of that dollar goes to help the worldwide work. Did you know that? The world still is dependent upon the U.S. dollar. And God has given us affluency and given us the ability to share what we have, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and the three angels' messages. So there you have Squanto kidnapped and taken to Europe about 1605, again, you will not be tested. Returned home about, um, was, yeah, one year before the Mayflower, and uh, Mayflower came in 1620. I think God was in it. 
All right, this was their attitude that first Thanksgiving, going to, facing the cold winter. Crops had not done so well. A lot of folk had died, no hospitals. Um, precarious place to live. They were all on their own. They had a one-way ticket over here. That was it. These are the verses that I think that we today could claim. I'm sure they were acquainted with him. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In what? Everything. In everything, give thanks. For this is God's will for you. What is God's will for you? That we should thank him for everything. I remember when I went in to allude to this during the anointing service, these words. I went into my doctor, uh, Dr. Tryon, about 17 years ago, and um, he said, I'm sorry to tell you, but um, the test came back, Charlie, and you have you know, cancer. I said, whoa, have you ever had, been told that? Wow. I was thinking, you know, something's, something's inside me. It's glowing. I can identify with Halcyon. She's been on quite a a journey with this. And then Dr. Tryon says, Charlie, nothing catches God by surprise. I remember going to Mayo Clinic and I was led like a lamb to slaughter. And uh, Sharon actually had to lead me around. They were showing me all the stuff that would, they could do. You could do this, you could have it frozen, you could have it removed, you could do nothing, you can, and this is what will happen. And, at Mayo Clinic, they even have, uh, you know, put a DVD in, in the uh, laptop and it'll show you the procedure, them actually doing this stuff on people. And I looked at that and I said, I don't want any of it. What's that? And then the elders of the church gathered around me and anointed me as we did Halcyon today. And there was a peace that came over me. And I've told you the rest of the story, I think, before where... The day of the surgery, we were in the little waiting room. I had my, my little gown on for surgery that's completely open in the back. That's uh, it's why they call it, I was told that day, an ICU gown. <laughs> <laughs> and I had the little hat on, you know. And my mother was with us up at Mayo in Minnesota. And she loved to play cards. Mother never gambled, but she played cards, didn't she, Sharon? So we're sitting there waiting, playing cards and having a good old time laughing, much different than the last time I was up there earlier to see what we were going to do. And the attending nurse came in and she looked, she says, y'all are having way too much fun. Do you know what in the world's about to happen to you? And I said, I sure do. Bring it on. The Lord's with me. <laughs> Rejoice in everything. There was a, an experience there that I had where it brought me closer with a walk with the Lord than I'd ever known before. And it was his will, by the way. I'm cancer-free. I'm checked twice a year, cancer-free. James 1, verse 2 in our scripture reading that Mikey read so well. Count it all joy when you fall into different trials. Well, that's hard to do. Have you ever smashed your thumb hammering? Yeah. I mean, you forget what pain is like. Recently, I missed a Sabbath here because I had, I had a, a tooth that uh, had a root canal. And I'll tell you, the root canal procedure itself, you praise the Lord for because it's instant relief. I mean, I could not sleep for four nights. I'll quit talking about this thing, but it's something I'll never forget is the pain that I had. It was horrible. It's hard to praise anything. But how do we do? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for giving me that experience because now I can identify more with those in pain. There's a reason why things happen to us. So count it all joy when you fall into different trials as the pilgrims did. There was a fellow in the same time period, a theologian, his name was Matthew Henry, and he wrote a seven-volume commentary on the Bible, still used widely. And uh, he was a godly man. He was at his prime in the 1600s, the early 1600s. And so eventually he died, as everyone will, until the Lord comes. And they found something in his keeping, in his stuff that he left behind. They were sifting through it. 
And it was his diary. He kept a diary every day of what he did, and they ran across one day's entry. He was robbed that day, held up and robbed. And here's what was in his diary for that day when he was robbed. He says, I thank the Lord that I was never robbed before. That's pretty good. He's, you know, in Mr. Sunshine, isn't he? And then he said, although they took my money, I thank the Lord that they did not take my life. And then he wrote, although they took my all, it really wasn't that much. <laughs> and then he said, I thank the Lord that it was I who was robbed and not I who robbed. You know, that's a little jab back at the guy that did it, but that's okay. Praise the Lord. He counted all joy. Psalm 147, verse 1. It is good to sing praises to our God. Do you do that? Sometimes I think we just need to stop and say, Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee how great thou art. We need to do that. My mother would go around the house singing all the time. Never would sing publicly. But I uh, just remember, I have fond memories of mother singing all the time. She was usually off key, but uh, made a joyful noise. So it says, it is good. Good for what? Well, first of all, it's good for you. It's good for me. It's good for us individually when we praise the Lord. It does something to our endorphins. It makes us feel better about life. And we're reminded, if we're singing praises to God, that there is a God, and he's still is at the will. Proverbs 17, verse 22. A merry heart does good like a medicine. And here I was all down and out. And, oh, the doctor said, uh, my doctor, one of my doctors said, do we need to give you a little something, you know, to help you with your spirits? I said, no, don't do that. Don't do that. And sometimes I'm not, not saying you shouldn't. Sometimes maybe you need that. But what I needed was an attitude adjustment. And a merry heart does good truly like a medicine and there's no, no, no side effects Psalm 146 verse 5 happy is he or she whose hope is in the Lord his God so it's good for you to praise the Lord the Bible says here's another one the joy of the Lord is your strength think about that when we give joy it's actually the Lord that's given it to us. We're sending it back to him. And it is our strength. The devil doesn't know what to do with it when he hits you and he thinks he's got you down. And you say, I'm going to praise him anyhow. Satan, you can do whatever you want to with me. I'm still going to keep seeking God's face. The joy of the Lord is your what? Strength. Keep praising him, even in the hard times. This lady is incredible. You can Google her and find a lot about her. Her name is Edith Eva Egger. Her friends call her Eddie. She's in her 90s now. She was born in 1927, so you can figure it. She was a survivor from the World War II. I don't think it was Dachau. I've been to Dachau. I might have been Auschwitz. But I've been to Dachau very much like these pictures look like the ones I saw at Dachau. She lost her mother and her father. They were gassed, probably burned. Um, in fact, she too was supposed to receive their fate. But the guy that was in charge here he found out that she could dance. Her whole family was musical. They all played instruments, violins, piano, and uh, she and sang. And uh, she could dance as well. And so the night that she, that her mother was actually executed, she had to dance, pull up the fortitude to dance in front of the guy that's leading out in this whole affair here. There she is. She's written a couple of books. She was 87 when she wrote a book that was like a Pulitzer Prize winning or whatever, um, award winning book. I have a choice of being a victim or a survivor. Get that? I have a choice. He said, what do you mean? Someone else made up the mind to do that to your parents and to wreck your family, to cause you pain. 
when they found Edith, they thought she was dead and she was on a pile of bodies that were to be disposed of. And a soldier, an American soldier, saw her finger move and he pulled her out of that pile. And uh, she, was, she was severely, um, well, it was, it was very doubtful that she would survive it. We create our own concentration camps, she says. She has her doctorate now in psychology. She's a counselor to help folk with post-dramatic drama. I refuse to be a hostage and prisoner of the past. I've seen things like this that are now, you know, gathering dust at Dachau. It's okay to go through anger about our past. It's not okay to get stuck in anger. And she mentions, I'm sure that if we get stuck, we're actually, the perpetrator is still in charge of our lives. So what do you do with these burdens? Are you weary? Are you heavy laden? Take it where? To Jesus. Take it to Jesus. That's the answer. The captors are the real prisoner, she said. If you would hate today, get that? If you would hate today, if I, excuse me, if I would hate today, I would still be a prisoner, talking about herself. And the last one, she says, the concentration camp is in your own mind and the key is in your pocket. It's about choice. Deciding who's going to be in charge. Is Satan going to be in charge? Or is Jesus going to be in charge? It's a decision we make every day when Paul says, I die daily. It's a decision we make daily. Revelation 12, verse 10, it's good for you According to Revelation 12, 10, it says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the what? How do we overcome Satan? Yes, by the blood of Jesus Christ, but we have to lay hold of it by word and testimony and tell what things the Lord has done for us. And when we say those things, it reinforces it. I knew a preacher, uh, his name was Harrington, I forget his first name, but he was called the preacher of Bourbon Street. He actually preached back in the 1960s out on the streets of, uh, in uh, New Orleans. And I went to hear him speak one night when he came through Chattanooga when I was in college. And he told about losing his little two-year-old boy and how angry he was with God because he lost his baby his son. And he was just crying out to God, how could you do this? How could you do this? And he began to think God lost his son too. And God hurts too. And he thought about the, our scripture reading today, count it all joy. And he thought about this passage, Revelation 12, verse 10, that the word of their testimony overcomes Satan. And so he began to say something that sounds very strange, but he said, I will praise you, Lord, in spite of my loss. And then he says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And he got up and he says, praise the Lord. And his wife came running in. She says, what in the world's going on? And he says, I just got the victory. And his ministry exploded after that. We need to praise the Lord sometimes when we don't feel the need to do it. We just don't feel like it. We need to go ahead and say, praise the Lord. Devil, you can give me all you want. I will still praise the Lord. And anytime we let the devil be in charge, we're giving him praise. Yes, it does hurt sometimes. Why is it good to praise the Lord? It's good for others. Now, if you live with a grump, you'll know that that would be nice if the grump would praise the Lord. <clears throat> I don't live with a grump. I live with an angel. And you know I've heard talk about she. I wake up every morning and see that smiling face. I'll tell you. I said, bring it on, Satan. <laughs> Ephesians 5, verse 20. Give thanks always, right? Give thanks for all things. Ephesians 5 verse 19, speak to one another in what? Look at that, spiritual songs. That's why we sing. That's why we sing in this church more than opening and closing hymn and you know that. No, we really praise the Lord here. 
There's nobody that says we have to sing these other songs and we throw them in to make God happy. Yeah, it makes God happy. But he says we should do this. And I remember again my mother singing these songs and they stick with me now. The words to them just uplifted the whole household as she would go around, puttering around the house, singing, humming songs, singing spiritual songs to each other and making melody in your heart. That's our privilege. It changes things, doesn't it, Halcyon? Yeah. Ephesians 4, verse 29. Let not any unwholesome talk out of, come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up, that it may benefit those who listen. Listen to me. Just because it's true doesn't mean it needs to be passed on. I mean, and I pray to God, God, give me wisdom to choose my words and my topic. Continuing to read, be kind and compassionate one to another. Telling us here to be positive in our communication. I can imagine those pilgrims as they enjoyed three days, they weren't sitting there, you know, down in the mouth, talking about what, the way it was back home. Remember when we had cake and ice cream. I had a little piece of pumpkin pie as a diabetic. That is significant on Thanksgiving. It was a little sliver, right? Yeah. And I praise the Lord for health. <laughs> These are the three C's that we should not do. I don't know where I picked this up. Don't criticize. Don't condemn. Don't complain. I had an altercation once with someone about a year and a half ago. And I was right. And I believe I was right. And it was a relative. And I believe that I could have called the police and that one would have been put away. Some people that knew and know the situation said, why didn't you? Because I believe that I need to take the high road. And you know what I found out when I told even my best friends what was going on? They didn't want to hear about it. They didn't want to hear the negative thought. So I quit talking about it. You know, it made me feel better too, that I didn't have to keep rehearsing what had happened. Don't criticize, don't condemn, don't complain. People don't want to hear complaining. If you need to really complain, go to a preacher, go to a counselor, go to one person that you trust, but don't just keep talking about it to everybody. You'll run people off. Mark 5, verse 19, tell them what is, what great things the Lord has done for you. Is there something that you could find in your life, the vocabulary of your life that the God has done for you? Talk about those positive things. No, you shouldn't sweep the ugly stuff under the carpet, but deal with it. Go to your prayer closet and deal with it. Go to one or two who you truly believe are spiritual giants or, or leaders and someone that can handle it. But tell everybody what great things the Lord has done to you and for you. I love this picture. Why should we praise the Lord? Because it's good for God. Do you realize that you can touch God's heart? Think about this. Do you realize that God is dependent on you for his happiness in a certain sort of a way? Oh, you say God's all powerful. God's not touched by anything we can do. God's not touched by negative thoughts, negative actions. Listen, God is touched. Revelation 4, verse 11, we were created for God's pleasure. What's that word? We were created for God's, what? Has, anything, has anyone ever done anything for you that made you happy? Huh? Am I pressing this too far that, that God doesn't have feelings? I mean, God has feelings. That we actually can touch God's heart. And when we praise him, and it's from our heart, that it brings pleasure to him. We were created to make God happy. Someone says, well, God's sovereign. 
Well, in that case, he didn't need to create us. We were created to meet a need of God. It says, for his pleasure, God created us. Jesus on the cross, it says, he hung there, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He's there hanging from the cross with nails in his hands, nails in his feet, a crown of thorns on his head, his back lacerated. And as he looks down through the corridors of time, he sees my face. He sees your face. And it brought him joy. And you know what Jesus said about God the Father? He said, my Father loves me even more because of what I'm doing for you. That's the Bible. We can bring joy to the heart of God by walking with Jesus now. By deciding we're going to stay in the boat. By deciding that we're going to finish the journey. And it's almost finished. Look around you. This world is coming to an end. And we can bring joy to Jesus by staying with Jesus to the very end. Psalm 149, verses 1 and 4. It's good, it is good to praise God. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. Isn't that beautiful? He takes pleasure in us. He loves us with a love we can't understand. There's a place in the heart of God, I said the first week I was here, and I'm saying it again, reserved just for you. And if you do not come to that place in the heart of God, God will forever be lonely for you. So let's praise the Lord today. Psalm 147, 7, 11, sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. The Lord takes pleasure in them that fear him. Please, I want all those who are leading the music to please come forward, or the one, and we're going to have a song of praise as we leave this worship service today. Sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Throw your head back and sing. Let us all stand, please. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give He's given Jesus Christ His Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done for us. And now Christ his son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son. And now let the weak say, Say I am rich because of what 
heaven we thank you for the promise that you are, will never leave or forsake us that you are with us to the very end that even when we walk through the darkness even when we are told the worst by the doctor that you are right there with us and you will be with us and that someday this mortal will put on immortality someday we will arise to meet the Lord in the air Someday, Lord, we will see those who have gone before us who are asleep in the grave. Lord, that there is hope. We thank you so much for all the promises that encourage us. May we hold fast to that which is good now as we reach the end of this year and go into a new one in Christ's name. Amen. God be with you. Do we? 